water. Water is life. Without water, there is no life. Without water, there is no beer. Sorry, but it's the truth. Beer is 90 to 95% water. That being said, water is the most impactful ingredient in beer. In fact, many of the classic beer styles that you drink today were formulated based off the water of that region. The alkaline water in Dublin gave birth to the beautiful stout. The high sulfate waters in Burton on Trent were the stepping stones of the pale ales and IPAs of today. And in Pilsen, the soft water gave us the world famous Czech Pilsner. Water can make or break a beer. As a brewer, you should pay attention to your water just as much as any other ingredient. So let's talk some water. The first thing you should do to determine if your water is brew worthy is drink it. If your water tastes good, then you're most likely able to brew with it. If you got some good brewing water, let's filter it. I highly suggest running your water through a two-stage filter, a sediment and a carbon filter. The sediment filter is gonna make sure you remove any debris from your water and the carbon filter is going to remove any odors as well as chlorine from your water. Chlorine removal is crucial if you have a public water source. The next thing you want to do is find out what's in your water. If you didn't know this, yes, there's stuff in your water. Most waters contain minerals from the surrounding environments and additives to ensure that your water is clean, safe, and drinkable. If you're on a public water source, you can contact your local water company and ask them for a water analysis report. And if you're on well water, you have two options. Send a sample of your water to a lab and have them do an analysis reading or purchase a water testing kit. You can pick up a Lamont water testing kit from morebeer.com for around 120 bucks. And it comes with instructions and everything you need to get readings on the six water factors brewers need. What we're interested in knowing as brewers is the following six levels. Calcium, magnesium, sodium, sulfate, chloride, and alkalinity. After we know these levels, we have the foundation for our brewing water. From here, we can modify the water any way we choose to brew any style of beer. Now, I'm sure there's some of you out there saying to yourself, I brew all kinds of beer with my water. Of course you can. You can probably also run a mile, but are you doing it to the best of your abilities? The School of Hops is here to make sure you brew beer to the best of your abilities. We want to modify our water to achieve a mash pH of 5.2 5.6 on every beer. For light beers, we want to target a more precise range of around 5.2 to 5.4, and for dark beers, we want to target a more precise range of 5.4 to 5.6. Ensuring that the mash pH is in the correct range is going to get you the best sugar extraction and get the best flavor from the mash. If your mash pH is too high, the potential for tannin extraction exists. And if the pH is too low, the beer can become too acidic. Additionally, we want to alter the water of our beers to allow the malt or hops to be more expressive. So let's talk about how to do this. After you get your analysis or test results, I'm going to recommend you record these numbers in a brewing water spreadsheet. There are numerous spreadsheets you can find online with a simple Google search. John Palmer literally wrote the book on water and I find his spreadsheet to work the best. I've included a link in the description to John Palmer's spreadsheet which you can download from howtobrew.com or armadabeer.com. No matter which spreadsheet you choose, find one that works best for you and stick with it. After you've entered in your source water information, you want to look for what the residual alkalinity of your water is. A good water spreadsheet will calculate and provide you with this. Residual alkalinity is important because it determines what color ranges of beer will work best with your current water. The higher the residual alkalinity, the darker the beer you can brew. The lower the residual alkalinity, the lighter of beer you can brew. For example, a beer with an SRM of 4, we would like to target a residual alkalinity of around negative 70. And for a beer with an SRM of 28, we would like to target a residual alkalinity of around 200. From my experience, I have found that I've never had to go over a residual alkalinity of 220, even for beers that calculated well over 30 SRM on the brewing software. Okay, so I laid down some basics of residual alkalinity. Let's talk about how to change your residual alkalinity of your water. Residual alkalinity can be modified by adding brewing salts and acids. Here I have laid out all the salts you'll need for brewing as well as a few options for acid additions. For salts we have gypsum, calcium chloride, calcium carbonate, table salt, epsom salt, and baking soda. For acids we have lactic acid, phosphoric acid, and acidulated malt. To lower your residual alkalinity with salts you can add gypsum, calcium chloride, or epsom salt. These salts will add hardness to your water in the form of calcium or magnesium. Acids can be used to lower your residual alkalinity. Acids will add additional hardness to your water. I use the acids to dial in the pH of a mash and make small, fine adjustments. You can also use acidulated malt to make adjustments to your mash pH. A good rule of thumb is 1% acid malt, 
for every 0.1 pH decrease. To raise a residual alkalinity, you can add baking soda or calcium carbonate. These salts will add alkalinity to your water. Calcium carbonate is a little tricky to work with though. It's like taking three steps forward and then two steps back. The calcium adds hardness, which in theory lowers the residual alkalinity, and the carbonate adds alkalinity, which raises the residual alkalinity. Overall, calcium carbonate raises the residual alkalinity, but not nearly as much as baking soda will. Now when using baking soda, you need to be very careful not to add too much because it will raise the sodium levels too high and make the beer salty. Did I lose you a little bit there? Anytime you add a salt to your water, you don't just adjust one variable, but two. Gypsum adds calcium and sulfate, calcium chloride adds calcium and chloride, Epsom salt adds magnesium and sulfate, table salts add sodium and chloride, baking soda adds sodium and carbonate, calcium carbonate adds calcium and carbonate to your water. It's important that you're aware of this when adding any salts to adjust your water. So now that you know a bit about salts and how they affect the residual alkalinity, let's talk about some of the mineral levels. Calcium is important for yeast cell as well as enzyme activity in the mash. The minimum calcium you want in your water is 50 parts per million. That's going to ensure that your yeast get a nice little healthy dose of calcium. Magnesium is also important. You want about four parts per million in your water minimum, but you never want to exceed 40 parts per million. I very rarely touch the magnesium levels on my brewing water because the water sources I've brewed with always contain some already. Sodium tends to be the highest in households that use a water softener. If your household has a water softener, I recommend pulling your brewing water before it makes it through the water softener. I don't suggest ever exceeding 50 parts per million of sodium in your water. I have found that around 35 parts per million is really nice in stouts and porters. If you ever heard of or ever seen anyone pour some salt in a stout, it's because it allows the malt flavors to round out. The ratio of chloride to sulfate will determine how the flavor of malt or hops will be perceived. If the chloride is higher than sulfates, the malt flavor will be perceived more. And if the sulfates is higher than chlorides, the hop flavor and bitterness will be perceived more. This is a balancing act. Literally, just because I said it will increase the perception doesn't mean to add a bunch of sulfate or chloride. Too much of either is not what you're looking for. You want to make sure you're adding just enough for one to be higher than the other for whichever way you want the flavor to go. Try not to exceed over 100 parts per million of chloride and 200 and farts. 200 and farts. 200 and farts. Try not to exceed over 100 parts per million of chloride and 250 parts per million of sulfate. So when do you add these salts? Salts are most commonly added in the mash tun. The spreadsheets you use are going to calculate the water for your mash. Salts can also be added to the boil kettle, though salts added at this time are focusing on altering the flavor, such as the chloride to sulfate ratio, and bumping up calcium levels. You're going to want to add your salts to your water prior to adding your grain. This allows for you to make sure that salts are dissolved evenly. On a commercial brewing level, you want to add a few barrels of water to the mash tun first, then throw your salts in and stir them up. This is called your foundation water. After you add your salts to your foundation water, you can start mashing in with your grain and water mix. Measuring your mash pH. Before I get into this next section, let's talk about pH readings. Stop wasting your time with those stupid f***ing pH strips. If you're serious about brewing, get yourself a digital pH meter. You can pick one up for about 25 bucks. I'm going to suggest this Hanna pH meter. It's 90 bucks, but it's reliable, offers a great warranty, and Hanna has some of the best customer service in the business. Now that I got that out of my system, after you've added all your grain to the mash and it's mixed well, the enzymatic activity has started taking place. I would suggest taking your first pH reading about five to 10 minutes after you've mashed everything in. This allows sufficient time for everything to do its job. To pull a sample, I wanna recommend you use some sort of a ladle. Pull your sample right from the middle of the mash. Pour the liquid into a glass, try to leave it behind as much grain as possible. The tiny ball jars work well for this. You only need a small sample of about 50 milliliters. You're gonna to wanna to cool this sample down to 65 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit. You can do this by dipping the glass into a small water and ice bath and stir it up. The probes in your pH meters are not designed to handle the high temps of a mash, especially the cheap ones. Even if your meter says it's ATC or automatic temperature compensated, putting your probe in such high temperature is destined to shorten the lifespan. When your sample is cooled down, take your reading. If you calculated your residual alkalinity correctly, the mash pH should be in the range of 5.2 to 5.6. If you're in the range, great. If you were targeting a pH of 5.2 and you got 5.4, just make a note of the next time you do this recipe to have a slightly lower residual alkalinity and vice versa if you want it to go higher. You can add an acid to adjust it down to the T, but honestly, if I'm within 0.2 of what I was targeting, I'm not really trying to mess with anything because it's good and it's way better than being out of range. If you shoot too low, it's very hard to come back up. Take what you got, 
and go with it. Now, if your reading is out of range, don't overreact right away. Make sure your meter is calibrated. Make sure your mash is fully mixed. Take another reading. If you continue to be out of range, then it's time to make an adjustment. If you're too high, you can simply add an acid to your mash. You want to start with as little as possible because a small amount goes a long way. Beersmith is great for acid calculations. You can type in the pH you got and the target you want to hit and it will give you a suggested amount of acid to add to hit your target. Before you make any adjustments, make sure to take at least one or two more readings. Measure twice, cut once. You can end up chasing your tail if you just react and start adding unnecessary shit. If your pH is too low, you can add some baking soda. But make sure to type these additions into your spreadsheet to make sure you don't go too far. Honestly, if you're way out of range, something else is a factor. I don't want to spend too much time on why I'm off because if you follow along so far, you shouldn't be off. When your mash pH is in the right range, it sets you up for success for the rest of the brew. You are less likely to have the pH drift above 6 during the sparge, which can cause tannin extraction. And the pH in the kettle is at its best range for hopulization. And the pH of the wort going into the fermenter is going to be at the best range for yeast and fermentation. Modifying your water to recreate a famous brewing region. As I had mentioned earlier, many of the classic beer styles you know today were born in a region of the world based on their water. Many homebrewers like to recreate the water of a region from around the world and brew that style of beer. Now there's nothing wrong with this practice and it's fun to see how different waters taste from around the world. To me, this is just not practical. One common misconception is thinking that brewers just worked with their water as is. Many breweries alter their water just like we do to brew their beers. For example, the water in Munich is high in carbonates. The brewers there pre-boil their water and let it cool overnight, allowing the carbonates to precipitate to the bottom of the kettle. Then they will decant the water off the chalk that is left on the bottom of the kettle, and now they have water with less carbonates and can brew a beer such as a Munich Helles. This is just one example, but there are hundreds of different techniques breweries use to pre-treat their water. You as a brewer should learn to work with the water you have available and alter it to benefit your beers. I just want to say that there's no software that will give you 100% accurate results every time. What is important is that we are working within a range. All these calculations are just guesses until they are put into practice. The only way you will become better at understanding your water is to keep practicing and educate yourself. I've spent hours researching, reading books, and practicing manipulating my brewing water to get the beers to taste how I envisioned them. Have I dumped beers that were not up to par? Absolutely. This is part of the business. If you're interested in learning more about water, pick up the following books. Water by John Palmer and Colin Kaminsky. How to Brew by John Palmer. And Lager Brewing by the legend Gregory Noonan. These are the first stepping stones you can take to making your best beers. Now I try to cover as much as I could without spinning your heads. I may throw another water video up if I deem it's necessary. Possibly one on how to use John Palmer's spreadsheet. Let me know in the comments if this is something you would like to see. Thanks for watching and don't forget to hit subscribe. Like and follow Armada Brewing on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Till next time.